Dear guests, welcome to Tallinn, chance time for Saikan, and um, I'm very happy to speak here and of course I also feel a little bit nervous because all this legacy comes down from uh, President Thomas Hendrik Ilves, the former president of Estonia, who has made it possible for the whole world to understand that this Woodstock place for Cyber East Tallinn. So please applaud President Thomas Hendrik Ilves here in the front line. Yes, Estonians have been strong in digital. Yes, Estonians understand better the risks related to digital. This is uh, in big part also he's doing, but the promotion work for Estonia, what he has been doing for 15 years at least, this is incredible. And I am forever grateful to him for this work which he has undertaken and still does undertake. Also, thank you, Merle, for this introduction and uh, for organizing uh, uh, this conference. It's the 10th time. And of course, it's very fitting that the theme of this conference now is about maximizing the effects. I would like to point out that the most important takeaways and lessons learned from these developments uh, that could really be used to do exactly that, maximize effects in order to keep our societies and citizens safe. What has changed globally since last year when we gathered is the awareness. I think the awareness level of cyber-related risks is much greater today than it was a year ago. Yes, it was openly spoken about cyber risks, cyber attacks, uh, attacks on systems, Ukraine, uh, also US has attributed the attacks to, uh, to Russia. Other countries have done so. But this year brought cyber risks close to normal people. They started to understand that a new set of natural laws, if you wish, have been created by evolvement of the technology sphere. People normally know without, well, we don't know when we learn it, but we all know that if you jump out of the window, then you fall down. But for some reason, people did not realize that if you're out in the internet, then you're visible. Now they understand it much better. And of course, numerous efforts have been made to make companies and governments responsible to protect people in the cyber. Alas, this is not possible. It will come down to individual action, individual level of cyber hygiene, how safe you are in the internet, how you are able to choose what is visible about you, how you are able to also understand that because some parts of you, your character, your interests is visible in cybersphere, then the bubble will be created around you, which will make sure, again, a new natural law, you will not see the opposing opinions. People just need to learn these new natural laws in tech sphere. And you know, this is also a great opportunity for all of us who are dealing uh, every day with the cyber risks, because now suddenly everybody's eager to learn. And I think I also talked last year about the spillover effects to civil society from the work which has been done in the cyber defense community to guarantee better cyber hygiene. Now is your time to jump. Now is your time to also make sure that the general benefits for, the, uh, uh, all, for all society will be maximized and that uh, people will be able to uh, benefit from, from what has been learned in cyber defense also in guaranteeing personal cyber hygiene at the highest possible level. Last year, for Estonia, it was an interesting year and we expected that we will have a very difficult cyber year as well because we were the EU Council Presidency and what better than to uh, demonstrate uh, that the digital state Estonia is not functional when it matters the most, when the EU uh, Councils gather in Estonia, when all EU uh, visitors um, come here. In fact, we didn't face uh, many incidents at all. We had some capacity issues instead with our own Wi-Fi, but that was a self-inflicted wound. These things also happen. We also had the uh, NATO's enhanced forward presence arriving in Estonia. Again, we predicted that we will have uh, cyber conventional uh, attacks and also hybrid attacks, uh, uh, Stratcom um, attacks against, um, against uh, this uh, NATO's well, very visible international presence in the Baltic states. There was only one case in Lithuania, which was very quickly uh, solved by Lithuanian authorities. I really would like to applaud them for that, that in uh, less than an hour they were able to uh, 
well, call the bluff and uh, explain to the whole world that uh, nothing had actually happened, that this was false news. Which again also so shows that the whole world has become uh, a little bit more resilient. It is possible to send the truth after the false statements and it is starting to have an effect. I think if we look three years back, four years back, it would have been much more hard to do. So some positive developments as well. Of course, we don't know that uh, what was the reason why we didn't come under heavy attacks uh, last year. Maybe there was a capacity issue. Maybe uh, our, well, our adversaries were busy somewhere else. We don't know, but maybe, maybe it was because we are quite resilient, because after all, we have worked a lot in these matters. On the other hand, we had a, we had a really uh, interesting crisis last year here in Estonia relating to our digital state, uh, but it had, not, had nothing to do with uh, attack. It had something to do with uh, the fact that nobody who is using uh, technology controls the whole production chain of this technology. As a small state, of course, we don't control practically any part of the production chain of this technology. And when one billion uh, chips uh, were withdrawn from the market by a chip maker, it appeared that uh, more than 700,000 of them actually were Estonian ID card chips. The rest of the chips worked in some other digital environments, in some other digital states on people's ID cards, but the majority were simply door cards, etc. It was interesting that uh, some other countries shut down their ID card systems and uh, I was sad that nothing happened. I mean, if you shut down an ID card system and you don't have a public riot, then you have not yet digitally disrupted your society. This was obviously the case elsewhere. Here in Estonia, of course, it was quite clear that um, we cannot, we cannot do that. Our people were not ready to go back to paper. It was interesting, the initial reaction of the society to this crisis was that maybe it's not that bad. It was exactly like you see the Second World War coming and you think maybe it's not that bad. The society read the news, decided it cannot be quite so bad because it was too big to believe. And so the society, including media outlets, everybody stabilized, stabilized closer to the cliffhanger, but decided to hang on. And this was a clear sign that um, whichever way we go solving this crisis, we absolutely have to make sure that uh, there is as little as possible physical displacement of people to go and um, do something. We managed for quite a number of people to patch up uh, the ID cards over internet, but some people could not. And of course, then it was very clear to us once more. Nowadays, we cannot be happy that we have digital and if something goes wrong, we have also the paper alternative somewhere. Estonia has to have digital with digital alternative. No other way will work. We have also the mobile ID and, um, and other options, but um, it's quite clear that um, we need to spend in the coming years quite some money to revamp our systems, to provide safe alternatives to the access to the systems, and also think quite quickly whether the whole technical nucleus, the whole technical platform of our digital state needs to be taken to a new level, for example, using blockchain. This would be now necessary not only to develop the services, because our state wants to be proactive towards its citizens anyway, and that demands blockchain anyway, but even to continue providing the current services, it seems to be that uh, we need to invest quite a lot. We have for years said that we save 2% of GDP only by signing digitally. Luckily, we also can say that 6% of our GDP is ICT. Uh, otherwise, it would be very hard to say that we also need to spend in upcoming years above definitely 1%, but in some years, maybe even close to 2% of our GDP to provide new solutions. This is my prediction. And uh, I would not at all be astonished if, uh, if this um, held true. We definitely need to... Uh, make sure that we stay ahead of the curve all the time. And uh, the main reason why, which I see, I know nothing of technology, but uh, what I can see is that if something is out there long enough, 
and it becomes really, really widely used and mainstream, then things start to go um, at one point a little bit wrong. And then it's time to move on to a stronger, newer technology platform. Simply because if people just, I don't know, out of fun, spend time in trying to figure out how to break certain systems for years and years, then they more and more often start to, well, have success. This is just a feeling and, uh, and uh, I think uh, we need to make sure that uh, this will not endanger the e-governance model of Estonia. Dear listeners, if we turn to the event that have uh, shaped the cyber conflict environment internationally, then last year we already talked here about the WannaCry attack that had just uh, wiped across the globe and brought uh, considerable impact with it. But then we had not yet seen the end of June, not Petya which was made to look like the work of ordinary cyber criminals, but was in fact designed to destroy information and brought global economic loss measurable in billions. In billions, not in millions. And uh, here is something that we, the politicians of the Western world, clearly have to think about. We can today say that uh, the investigations of both of these destructive campaigns have finished and uh, public attribution has been made by our uh, good friends and allies joined also by our government in the case of NotPetya. But strong words will not stop those attacks from happening again. In order to avoid them in the future, we have to change the calculation of the governments who either organize these attacks or just allow them to happen on their digital infrastructure. Cyber should not anymore look like an easy weapon and using it should include some considerable risks for the perpetrators as well. In order to achieve that, we have to be ready to use stronger tools than we have been so far using. The governments have to be ready to respond to the attacks. The governments, first of all, have to be ready to call these attacks a violation of international law. We all know that sanctions are most effective against those who don't have any sanctions affecting them yet. They're also easy to apply because um, this level of retaliation is not legally very demanding. Basically, you don't have to prove anything that much. There is no need to prove physical damages at the level which could be seriously crippling and um, thus allowing for stronger countermeasures. Therefore, we should not overlook the possibility to use political and economic responses, but then they really have to be such that they have a deterring effect. There should also be measures to support those who are digitally failed, who are not able to control the attacks from the base of their uh, digital infrastructure, out of lack of resources or uh, out of complacency. For example, if a country is not able to stop somebody attacking from their infrastructure, then it should have a method and a means to call for some international collective help. And this help should also have clear limits of what can be done and cannot be done on that infrastructure from where others are trying to help to stop uh, the campaign. If Western world would make it clear, by example, to third states that um, allowing cyber campaigns to happen via their digital infrastructure could bring sanctions, at least distrust, we could bring much more order into cyberspace. Attributing attribution of uh, cyber attacks and campaigns, this may be technically challenging, but it's now proven that it's actually quite possible. It's not impossible. And therefore, we must make it quite sure that our international consensus has a way and means on how to react. We know that every time we attribute something, people will demand proof. But in cyber world, like in any other international law cases, you don't need to disclose fully the proof. Attribution can be done safely, explain to partners and allies, bringing us all together to make stronger retaliation. Without that, it remains, cyber remains the tool which is free for all to use the way they want. Talking about maximizing effects, then during our EU Council presidency, 28 member states agreed to guidelines on how should those political and economic responses to malicious cyber activities be carried out. And as the bureaucratic work is done, 
then of course we as politicians will now have to do the political work and be ready for the political and diplomatic response of EU if any government decides to use cyber attacks against us. And here I am again quite happy that in April foreign ministers of EU were able to take the first step to such direction by adopting the Council conclusions on uh, malicious cyber activities. All this talk about EU's measures is backed up by NATO's decision that uh, Article 5 applies to cyber attacks as well. That cyber has turned into a fourth domain of operations and the policy of strategic ambiguity in regards to the means and ways of response. Because by the end of the day, this is why EU and NATO were set up in the first place to maximize the effects of their member states, now also in the cyber domain. Finally, I would like to touch upon some of the relevant changes over the last year in regards to the age-old attribution issue. It is true that attributing cyber incidents to states will not be also in the future an easy task. There are misperceptions and they have held states seriously back. Why the paralyzing effects have been overcome? I'm quite sure that states will now be braver in their action. But of course, then the problem is that um, if one or two or three of us decide to be brave and there is no strong reaction, even if we have administratively agreed the tools in European Union, even if we have international law base for that, then the situation will become actually worse than it is currently. Because previously, okay, we were coming to terms, we didn't know what to do, how to do, we didn't have a framework. Now we do have the framework. And if we now don't use this framework, then we soon get to the, state, uh, to the stage where uh, techie guys will tell us that we don't want to bother with the attribution. It's, it's expensive and uh, there are no gains to be had. And it's very hard to uh, say no, the gains will be there if quite quickly now we don't see concrete, real political gain for doing a brave attribution exercise and going through with it. This is extremely important. Naming and shaming may seem like a soft measure, especially against countries like Russia and North Korea, who fiercely deny their involvement and make it seem like they have been deeply and unfairly insulted and then demand concrete proof. It's, it's not easy to stand there alone. You have to have very quick reaction, very quick support to the speed which we saw also when Europe and the world and NATO was reacting to the Salisbury incident in UK. Cyber incidents can be as terrifying, cyber incidents can be as dangerous to our infrastructures. And if they yet now aren't so, then they would become so if, they, if we let them to continue without much stronger and clearer retaliation measures. If we talk about technicalities, this was good for the first 10 years of this conference series as well. We have to bring law in stronger because then we will be able to work really and reverse the current understanding and attitudes that uh, cyber war is free. So far, I feel that cyber war has been to a certain extent free. On the other hand, I'm not also too optimistic that we will see quick changes because uh, in some cases also the real war has not cost that much to those who, well, keep promoting them also in the Europe. I'm not that optimistic, as you may hear, but still I think we need to strive and I call upon all of us to uh, continue this work. Have an interesting conference, have interesting debates and discussions, and I will now leave you here to listen to the most interesting speakers of this conference. Thank you for listening.